want you to stand as we read our scripture to you tonight, found in Matthew's Gospel, and it's the 22nd verse. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, the Bible said that if you called a man a fool, you could be in danger of Gehenna, a pit on the outskirts of Jerusalem where the worm dieth not. So tonight I have chosen to bring to you a message entitled, The Seven Biggest Fools That I Have Met. And I want you to know that what I have to say tonight is going to come from the Bible because I'm still scared to call a guy a fool and I want God to do the calling tonight. But I want to introduce these kind of fools to you. The first fool the Bible mentions is found in Psalms, the 14th chapter, and the first verse, and it says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. People ask me constantly, Wade, do you believe there are atheists in the world? And I have to be perfectly honest about it and say, Yes, I do believe there are atheists in the world. But I'd like to quickly add that I believe that they are learned atheists. And by that I'm saying that they have the environmental circumstances involved in their life that has caused them to believe there isn't a God. I believe every person that has ever lived, God has planted within the breast of that individual to believe there's someone higher than he is. And there's someone greater than what that individual is. I was on an airplane not long ago, coming from Knoxville to Atlanta. However, I was going to Washington. But you know, you don't fly anywhere without going to Atlanta. Most of those dear Georgians believe when they die, if they're good, they get to go to Atlanta when they die. Well, that's not so bad. Most of us Baptists believe that if we're real good, when we die, we get to go to Nashville. Well, if I had my choice, I'd rather go to Tennessee anyhow. But you know... Uh, while we were riding on that airplane, I began to witness to him, began to share with him what Christ meant to me. And I found out that this fellow didn't even believe in God, much less Christ. And uh, when we got into Orlando, we had a meal together, and we started to Washington. And on that flight, he began to probe in to my relationship with God. He said to me, young man, can you prove to me scientifically that there is a God? Well, you know, I'm not too smart. And I don't have a lot of the words. And I don't know how to express all the things I'd like to say. But, but gee whiz, I knew there was a God. And so I looked at this intelligent uh, scientist and I said to him, uh, You know, I'm just a little bitty preacher and I don't know all the answers. Maybe you can help me. And uh, I said, I've got a question, you answer mine, I'll answer yours. He said, fire away. I said, can you prove to me that there is such thing as a mother's love? He said, a what? I said, a mother's love. He said, what in the world has that got to do with God? I said, just answer my question. And then he began to answer my question the best that he knew, you know. He said, why, well, everybody know, knows there's a mother's love. I said, amen. And he says, you can't see a mother's love, but you can feel a mother's love. I said, amen. And more he was telling me about a mother's love, more he was defining in the test tube of a laboratory of intelligence. The laboratory of intelligence that there is a God. And it wasn't long when he finished, then he realized he had defined a God. Now the Bible says that men who stalk the earth and have the audacity to say there isn't a God, you can say from God's word, God says they're a fool. And there's a lot of fools roaming this country of ours tonight. Then the second fool that I want you to see is found in Proverbs, the first chapter and the seventh verse. And the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So I have defined that fool as the fool who has no fear of God. Now I suppose 
Everyone that I'm speaking to tonight believes there's a God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe there was a God. But everyone that I'm speaking to tonight has not the fear of God in their life. It would be better, my friend, that you never believed there was a God than to believe there's a God and not have fear in your heart for that God. The Bible warns us about the respect in which we're to give the Creator of our souls. And people ask constantly about the problems of America. There are no problems that America cannot have solved if she would come back to the fear of God. When people can go to the Supreme Courts in this land and can demand for the Bible reading to be taken out of the schools and the prayer, and the Supreme Court will obey their demands and will penalize the rest of this nation, I can say to you there are people who have no fear of God. And there's a lot of people like this. Many of you sitting listening to me tonight, many are like Ananias and Sapphira of the early church. We can walk into the church of the 20th century and we can find us a place in a pew and we can listen to the Word of God and we can see what God has said in His book and yet go out without the fear of God. And the Bible said that God killed Ananias and Sapphira for lying against the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that God is going to do that even tonight. The Bible warns us there's a line that a man can cross. There is a place of no return. And when a man can cut this line and not have fear in his heart concerning God, the Bible said that man is a fool. It's high time that this nation of ours, it's high time that we who are in Christ tonight come back to the fear of God. When I was a lad, we used to preach that kind of message. We warned our people that God would use any method to bring His people back. Even the death of a child, the sickness of a child, in many cases even the death of a church and the death of a nation. And people don't like that kind of preaching, so we quit preaching that kind of message. But whether we like it or not, we must get the fear of God back into our pews and back into our pulpits, lest we perish tonight. And then another fool that I want you to see is found in Proverbs 14, 9. This is a very dangerous fool tonight. And the Bible says, fools make a mock at sin. Fools make a mock at sin. There was a lady not long ago that was on the television screens throughout the nation. She just happened to have made the statement that if they wanted to take the millions of dollars that they possess and use it to put one of their children in the White House of America, that was their business. But that dear lady forgot about one thing. Money may buy power, but money cannot buy life. And the Bible says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall that man reap. When you make your money off of scotch in America, and when you make your money from the deceitfulness and the cunning ways of the devil, it's going to have a way to come back. And there's many people tonight who are making a mockery of sin. And they're finding themselves in the web and in the impossible mess of sin. I have seen great preachers caught in the web of materialism and in the web of sex. I have seen great deacons and the statues of great men humble at the sickle of sin. God has never taken the degree of sin and its penalty away. Now we may try to do it when a man kills another man in America and we allow that man to go stark free. But that's not God's court. When God said a life for a life, there'll be a life for a life. This nation cannot stand until she stands upon the principles of this book. And we must not water down the laws and the moral precepts of this word tonight. And God warns us of the mockery of sin. The pornographic literature that is being in the hands of the young people from the adults of this generation 
is going to reap the sex perverts of a tomorrow. We're already feeling the weight of sin in our nation, the rioting, the burning, the looting. This is only the beginning. If God brought with his uh, day of judgment upon Rome, God will bring the day of judgment upon America. If the great nations of yesterday fell in the swimming pools of sin and sunk to their death, this nation is in for her death the same way. And God will not allow us to get by with our sin. Many of you are sitting there tonight and God's terming you to be a fool. You have lost all decency. You have lost all respect. And the morals of this book have been broken. And the Ten Commandments no longer live within your breast. And God has promised destruction upon all those who fail from his way. Now the Bible warns us even concerning the life of Belshazzar. Who had the golden vessels filled with wine. And he made sport and made laughter concerning God in the temple. We have taken the holy things of this day. And we have misused them and abused them. And God warns us that we cannot get by with our sin. And the Bible warns us tonight that a man who thinks that he can is a man who is a fool. And then in Proverbs, the 10th chapter, the 18th verse, the Bible says, He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. And I read a book not long ago, A Drink at Jaws Place. And the author compares the church with a bar of this generation. And he makes this difference. He says the difference of the church and the bar, and the reason the bar is so successful, is simply because... They'll give the people what they advertise, the choicest product of the brewer's bar. Now, if you walk into a bar, they won't give you a glass of milk. They're going to give you what they advertise. If a fella doesn't uh, feel like talking, he can sit at the end of the bar and he can drink by himself and nobody will bother him. You try that in a church. We're going to make you sing or you're going to wish you did. We're going to make you give or you're going to wish that you had. And then sometime, you know, when a fellow has a lot of problems, he can walk into a bar, order the choicest product of the Brewer's Ark, sit down and have a beer and tell all of his troubles to the bartender. And the bartender will listen very patiently. And then he'll put his money down and turn around to walk off and say, Boy, you're a big help to me. I feel the load off of my shoulders. I'm ready to go out into the world. And the Bible says to the Christian, let us confess our sin one to another. And you confess your sin to another Christian in the church, and everybody in the church will know about your sin. We don't keep secrets. I saw a woman not long ago. She said to me, I can keep a secret. It's the people that I tell that can't keep a secret, you know. And the Bible warns us tonight about the sins of gossip. The Bible says we're to love one another. And this love is not radiating throughout our congregation. And I remember a dear colored woman who raised us as a lad. And I can recall the time she used to take the stick and beat the clothes in the big black pot. I'm a little older than some of you realize. And uh, she used to do a lot of talking over that pot. One day I sneaked up behind her and scared her half to death. And I said, Sarah, who in the world were you talking to? She looked at me and she said, now nah, son, she said, the Bible tells us there's two kinds of people. And there's God and there's the devil. She said, sometime I'm talking to God and sometime I'm talking to the devil. I said, Sarah, which one were you talking to this time? She says, I was talking to God. And I said, what were you talking to God about? She said, some people have been mean to Sarah. And they've talked about Sarah and they've said some lies on Sarah. And I said, is that what you were doing? You were talking to God about it? And she looked at me and she said something. I shall never forget it. 
She said, you know, when people talk about me, you know what I do? And boy, by then my eyes were big, you know. And I said, no, what do you do? She says, I tell Jesus on them. That's what I do. I tell Jesus on them. And I wish that our Christians would learn that when we've been offended and somebody has said something about us and our feelings have been hurt, instead of telling someone else, instead of running around with gossip, we need to stop and just tell Jesus on them. Amen? Amen. Why don't you try it next time then and just tell Jesus on them. And the Bible says the person who goes around talking about another person and sowing lies and slander and have hate in their heart is a fool. If you look quickly in your Bible to 1 Samuel 26, 21, you'll find something that a king said about himself. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. Because my soul was precious in thy eyes this day, behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Now here was a king that said concerning himself that he was a fool. Have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and said you were a fool? Have you ever been able to bring yourself to the place that you could honestly admit that you were a fool? Here's a king that admitted he was a fool. And I term this man as the fool who tried to hurt God's servant. And ladies and gentlemen, there are two kinds of people that I don't want to be guilty and hurting and saying anything about. The first one is the Jew. I hear a lot of people say a lot of things about a Jew, but you won't hear this evangelist say anything about a Jew. And the second person is a preacher of the gospel. I'm not going to talk about the preacher of the gospel. I just believe that the Lord called them and the Lord can handle them. And to be perfectly honest about it, nobody can handle a preacher but God. Now there are deacon boards that try it, but it doesn't work. It causes a lot of problems. There's only one person that can handle a preacher, and that's God. He never called the WMS or the WMU or any other W's to handle the preacher. He never called a little special society within the church to handle the preacher. I just will not be guilty in talking about a preacher of the gospel. I read a story in 1 Kings where old Rehoboam put his hand on the man of God and you know what happened to him? The Bible said his hand withered up. There are a lot of people tonight who are not as great as great in the kingdom's work as they have been because they have erred in their ways concerning the man of God. It goes back to what I said about the dear colored woman. If you've got problems in your church, and if you see a preacher that has problems in his life, don't go tell someone else. Tell Jesus on him. Jesus can handle the preacher. And he never intended anyone else to handle we're not going to have revival in this nation until people start respecting the ministry and the preaching of the gospel. And then if you'll notice, the Bible says in Luke 12, 16, concerning the rich man, that he was a fool. He tore down his barns and he decided he'd build greater ones and he'd just take care of all the things that he had. I can see him with the old hound dog at his side and rocking in his chair. And he was saying to himself, So take thou ease and eat, drink, and be merry. And you've got everything now. Don't worry about it. And doesn't this sound like America? We are the 20th century divers. And the rest of the world is the Lazarus. And they just ask for the crumbs from the rich man's table. The Bible said that it'd be awfully hard for a rich man to go into the kingdom. The reason for that, I think we're all aware of it, the entanglements of materialism. If there's one thing that is destroying us tonight, it's the materialistic life. It has its dirty, filthy, lucrative hands on us tonight. And when you talk to the average congregation in America, 
about people dying because they have nothing to eat. They don't know what you're talking about. Because we have so much. We're depending too much on things. And we've let God out. I have been guilty of saying that I think that it would almost be a blessing for depression to come upon America again. May be a blessing that our cars have no value and our homes have no value and the things of materialism have no value. And then maybe we'll learn the scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then these other things will be at. I wish to God we could convince the people of this generation the truth to that scripture tonight. And the last food that I want to introduce to you tonight is found in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the tenth verse. If you're depending on your riches tonight, the Lord says you're a fool. But if you're going to be a fool, I'd like to introduce this last one to you. This was the Apostle Paul speaking concerning his life and another Christian. He said, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you, ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we're despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor working with our own hands, and being reviled, we bless, and being persecuted, we suffer it, and being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. We are the offspring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, to warn you. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to be a fool, and we are fools tonight, why don't we learn to be a fool for Jesus? And I thank God, a few years ago, I found the answer. There's but one way for peace and joy and happiness. And that comes through being a fool for Jesus. My wife and I had the privilege to be at the Niagara Falls just recently and we climbed that tremendous tower 800 and some odd feet they had a revolving restaurant up there we had some friends with us from newport tennessee and we wanted to eat up in this revolving restaurant in fact we called our children from canada all the way to tampa florida and told them that we were standing on top of the world overlooking niagara falls i went up there for a real purpose. I had Bibles in my hand and I had tracts and I had a little car. When we got to the top, I started with a bartender. He was just a mixing a drink, just as hard as he could, you know, turning it upside down and all around. And my, he was enjoying it, you know, flipping it around and everybody waiting on their drink. And here he was, both hands on it, and I handed him a little car. And, uh, he just had to stop, you know, and he put his little card down and he kept right on working and looked at that card and he kept right on, and then finally stopped. And that card said, Woe is the man who puts drink to his brother's lips. And somehow he just couldn't shake that thing like he was shaking. Like shaking. And then I went around on the tables up there, the little girls running around with very little on. And I began to put tracts and little Bibles and, and people began to read them, you know. And I gave every waitress up there the same card. Woe is the man that put his drink to his brother's lips. We were on this elevator going all the way down and oh, it was real crowded. It's a, we had a situation, you know, that occurred. There was a couple of fellows on there. You heard about it, I'm sure, the friends. And uh, it was so crowded and so hot on the elevator. His friend said, you know, uh, I believe one of our deodorants is wearing out. And his friend looked at him and said, man, don't look at me. I don't use the stuff, you know. It, it was that crowded on this elevator. And we was going down. And, and one man said uh, to another man on the elevator, said, 
You know, there's a nut up there, and he's going around saying, who is the man that put a drink to his brother's lips? He's going to hell. Well, that's not what the card said, but I liked his interpretation, you know, to that scripture. And my wife smiled, and the people that was with me that smiled, and, and I looked at that fellow, and I said, sir, would you like to have one? And I thought he was going to pass out. And he said, you know, I thought that was a grand thing you were doing up there. I said, yeah, how do you feel now, you know? I enjoy being a fool for Christ. And that's better than being some of the fools that I have been by far. And I want to continue to be known as a fool for Jesus Christ. We need to get men out of the pew and get them to the front of an altar and have them asking God to forgive them and commit themselves to become fools at work. You wouldn't allow someone to curse your wife? Why, of course not. If I offended your family, you would not allow that. But we allow man where we work to use God's name in vain and never one time do we stand up and speak out concerning that. We're going to have to be fools, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to see a world brought to Jesus Christ. Shall we stand for prayer?